I'm Caleb Kid Coy, Epic Legacy Hero Builder, and I'd like to welcome you to Living Like a Bank. Along with myself, you'll hear from other successful experts and people who are busy serving and empowering many lives. You'll see how we're showing others to become debt-free in record time as they build economic discipline while generating a bulletproof family legacy revenue stream together. We'll learn how to live and operate just like the banks do. Hey, what's up, everybody? Caleb Kid Coy here, Alchemy Slayer of Mediocrity, Heroic Family Legacy Builder, and host of Living Like a Bank podcast. And we're back at you with the Business Book Club. And we're going to be talking about law number five of Robert Greene's book, The 48 Laws of Power, and guarding your reputation with your life. Mr. Chris McFarland is back with me in the studio. Chris, uh, appreciate uh, our discussion on law number four that last time. A lot of thought-provoking content we covered there yes, and sir. excited to dig into reputation. This is uh this is a big deal in an age of social media where in a moment's time, mm-hmm. right? Your, your reputation can go from bad to worse, from good to bad or vice versa. And what a tool that we have essentially to guard, isn't it? It is. Um, and, uh, and, and we're here to, we're here to rep for a lot of different things. Uh, uh, that's kind of what leaving a legacy sort of means, right? Is your, your reputation. That's le- what is legacy. Uh, it's, it's basically the beliefs or opinions of others, right? And uh, Green calls it the cornerstone of power. Cornerstone. So much depends on reputation. Guard it with your life. Judgment. Reputation is the cornerstone of power. Through reputation alone, you can intimidate and win Once it slips, however, you are vulnerable and it will be attacked on all sides. So make your reputation unassailable. Always be alert to potential attacks and thwart them before they happen. Meanwhile, learn to destroy your enemies by opening holes. And we're going to substitute that word enemies again with uh, what do we decide? Adversaries or uh, uh, what was what was the term we used? Competitors. By opening holes to their own reputations, then stand aside and let public opinion hang them. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, uh, this this one, the first time I read through this chapter, it kind of challenged me because I've never just personally, idiosyncratically, been a huge fan of P.T. Barnum. I always kind of thought of him as a, as a sort of a scoundrel and, mm. and Green sort of throws him up as a hero. But, um, you know, he's we're still talking about him. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and so this is the four, this isn't the 48 laws of being a good person. <laughs> <laughs> this is the 48 laws of power. Right. And so right. we're still talking about this cat, Mr. Barnum. And um, and also Edison, um, you know, I've, I've learned a lot more about Edison uh, since I was younger and like in high school. And, uh, he, you know, the more I learn about him, the more I think he's like Barnum. And I'm a little bit all over the place here, but I actually want to start where one of the things he does at the back of the story he talks about one of the overreaches that Edison did uh, with Tesla and, uh, and how he uh, uh, was trying to ruin his Tesla's reputation about alternating current mm. believed in direct current. Mm-hmm. And he, he murdered all kinds of like squirrels and rabbits and rodents and cats and dogs and pigs and stuff uh, to, to try. And that, when that didn't do it, he arranged for the state uh, to create the electric chair. And then gruesomely, he didn't calculate it right, and they didn't charge it enough to kill the guy, and they had to redo it. Oh man! And and it, it ended up being graphic here. It ended up being such a backlash against him that it temporarily hurt his reputation by trying to. De- so I just want to lead off with that that when you're when you're talking, we are going to be talking in this chapter about what Green says about attacking other people's reputations, but I think you also have to uh, be careful even just on your own self-interest about overreaching and ruining your own reputation as you try and do that Mm -hmm. and again this applies on any level uh, anywhere whether you're you know trying to be a social media influencer or a a good parent or a a, a manager or business owner or doctor lawyer priest teacher almost anything right i think this does apply because sometimes we can be maybe too grandiose about power power is simply in a social setting, using words to get other people to adhere to your view of thinking about things. Mm -hmm. It may be a great example in reference to the previous law, right? Less is more Mm -hmm. saying less. Okay. We, we, we hear green talk about 
these examples and moments where, okay, maybe you need to say things that essentially discredit somebody else's reputation, but how you go about doing that is crucial, right? Overreaching is going to come back to bite you in the butt. That's it sounds right. like more of a, a defense play as well. Is, is that how you took it? I mean, yes, because I, I, one of the big things I've thought and said from the beginning in all of our episodes is even if you are not ambitiously trying to use these laws of power to exert your own power, and I don't know why you wouldn't. Hmm. I don't know why you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. you, you owe it to yourself to try and exert your own power in the world, don't you? Mm -hmm. But even if you're only using it defensively, you should be aware of what other people are trying to do to you. Precisely. And we've always said that from day one. So let's get to the sleeping dragon story. I can't wait to talk about this. Yeah, yeah we, we, can, we can definitely get into that. And I was just going to note that as, as much as I appreciate, you know, him using the big P word because it does provoke, right, various emotions in people and, oh, you're on a power trip, dude, type of thing. <laughs> right. At the same time, in my mind, this book could have easily been named 48 Laws of Influence. And so yes. I just want to. Uh, exhort you guys as you're thinking right. about this to always reference back to that. We're talking about how to essentially have the most influence with people and in situations and things like that. So Chris, let's dig into the story a little bit, huh? Quite intriguing. Yeah, you're, you're right. Just to wrap up your last thing, he could have called it observations on influence and it probably wouldn't have sold as well, but it'd be more accurate. <laughs> <laughs> but, I think the know, title had something to do with sales, right? I think so. And, and hey, that's a powerful move, right? It is a power move. Power move. <laughs> so um, sometimes power can be doing nothing. Mm. Let's talk about that. So there's this story. power is passivity. Is that what you're getting at? Well, it, it, mm. it, it, we're gonna. I, you, we'll be the. We'll, we'll let the audience be the judge of that. So back in third century, um, what's what we now call China, and I hadn't really uh, uh, gotten to what we know as China now, but it was the Su Dynasty was in charge. Mm -hmm. And uh, th this guy, a uh, general, uh, he had a bigger army, but he wasn't really with his army. He was only with his small garrison. Uh, and he only had 100 men with him. And, uh, or, and he was cornered by a, a force that outnumbered him 1,000 to 1. Boom. They basically caught him with his boots off. Yep. Okay. And um, instead of panicking, he ordered his men to hide, take down the flags, open the gates, and he went up on the top of the wall where everybody could see him. And he sat in a Buddhist meditative pose and just started chanting and, and doing these uh, these like rituals and chants and stuff. Hmm. And when the other general came up, he was like, what's going on here? Culture reference. Uh, anybody who's seen Game of Thrones remember when uh, um, uh, the, the Lannister uh, Casterly Rock was supposedly abandoned with a small force Hmm. but they really used it to set him up for a head fake. So the other general was worried about something like that happening. And so he sat there for a minute and he thought about the sleeping dragon's reputation. And, and he remembered that he knew who this general was very well because of reputation. Mm -hmm. So his reputation had been created. So it's not, I don't know that we could really say it's from nothing because, because the re if you, if he was just a nobody, this wouldn't have worked. <laughs> <laughs> True. But he, he had this reputation of being somebody, long story short, who would use double agents and false flag operations and even character assassination to get to his power, mm. which we're going to get into a little bit more of all that in the next couple topics. Right. <laughs> and so when he's sitting up there, the guy's like, this has got to be a head fake. Now nah, we're retreating. We're out of here. Even though mm. he had him a thousand to one dead, dead to rights. And I've got one more bonus story that Green doesn't talk about, but, but I know, and I've got, I've got to go over this story real quick because it kind of shows the same thing. Let's hear it. So uh, Miyamoto Musashi, uh, who wrote the book of Five Rings, uh, Goring Des, uh, he tells a story, of, of, there's a story about him, I should say, that he challenged this other samurai who was like a really great samurai, but he set him up. He said, uh, he, he, he basically messed with his mind. And he said, I'm going to meet you on the beach in the morning. And I'm going to beat you with a wooden sword that I carve out of a tree trunk on my way over. And so he literally does that. He rows over from this adjacent island. And on his way over, he uses this knife he has to carve like a, a practice sword. Not a, not a proper sword, mind you. 
but like one of these wooden, you know, like practice sorts. Mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and he stands there in the mud and the muck and the guy has to come out into the surf where he's not used to fighting and where he can't do any of his movement that he's used to doing. Ah. And he starts swinging at him and he's, he's pissed because this guy, this guy Miyamoto has like ruined all of his credibility and everything with almost no words. This other guy's been talking more than Coralanus, the guy with the sharp sword that can cut through a person two seconds Miyamoto said almost nothing. He just said a note, I'll meet you on the beach and I'll beat you with a wooden sword. But wow. because of Miyamoto's reputation for being the greatest samurai, this guy goes for it and he gets off of his ground and he gets drawn into it mm -hmm. and he goes out there and Musashi ducks a couple of times, hits him once with the wood sword in the head, fight over, gets back in the boat and rows off. Wow. Miyamoto Musashi. Ah, us. Mm. I think he made his point there quite clear and concise, didn't he? As if with a wooden sword. <laughs> I like that. Let's talk about keys to power for a minute here and what Green said. Now, the people around us, even our closest friends, will always, to some extent, remain mysterious and unfathomable. Fair enough. Yep. Their characters have secret recesses that they never reveal can't be the unknowableness of other people could prove disturbing if we thought about it long enough since it would make it impossible for us to really judge other people we don't really know people sometimes do we we don't really know ourselves sometimes thank you forget yeah I guess yeah so we prefer talking. to ignore this fact mm -hmm. and to judge people on their appearances Correct. ouch Correct. on what is most visible to our eyes whether clothes gestures words or actions in the social realm Appearances are the barometer of almost all of our judgments, and you must never be misled into believing otherwise. One false slip, one awkward or sudden change in your appearance can prove disastrous. So this is the reason for the supreme importance of making and maintaining a reputation that is of your own creation. Thought-provoking right. words there, Chris, huh? And another word for what we're talking about here is fame, right? Somebody cue David Bowie. What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? Mm -hmm. Um, but it, uh, Nietzsche said it's easier to cope with a bad conscience than a bad reputation. Mm. It's kind of true. It is. And, and we're not advocating having a bad conscience. Right. But, but if you're, if you're gonna, if you're gonna go for it, you're not sure. I, I love how you brought up. We're not sure about ourselves. So how can mm. we be sure of others? If, if we're honest with ourselves, because back to, back to uh, actually in our last broadcast, uh, I quoted some Taoism right at the very end of it. But uh, kind of the essence of Taoism is basically that if you think you know, you don't know. Like it, it, there is a thing that can be known, but to say you know it is always wrong. Mm. Now, when we, I, I'm going to go back to my favorite quote, and I might have even used this before, but Socrates famously said, they say that I am the wisest of all the Greeks. It is because I know that I know nothing. Hmm. So I think that's uh, reflective of being self-honest. Michael. What I'm now going to call a PPP, although I'm not giving any loans, a producer pop culture pocket. <laughs> um, I just wanted to- Wait, it's ERC, of, isn't it? No. Right. I just wanted to kind of reference that the book was written in 1998, and I just kind of wonder how this law would be reframed or would be potentially rethought in the era of, of uh, cancel culture. That. Mm. You know, your reputation can so not be in your own control that literally things that you said 20 years ago can be used to completely destroy your reputation. And you have, uh, you are almost powerless to correct it. Now, this is not a referendum on positive mm -hmm. or negative on that. I'm just talking about the practical effects. Mm -hmm. Some people who have been canceled deserve to be canceled because of things that they did. Some people who got canceled, mm -hmm. it was an over correction. I'm just talking about the actual mechanism that, that, that the mechanism of how in today's world with social media and, and, and the proliferation of 24 hour news cycles and the amount of outlets for social media and for, for news and, and for, for avenues of attack to people's reputation. Mm -hmm. You know, I wonder how, how this law would be reframed in that context. Interesting. That's a great uh, topic, Michael. And, and I think if I would presume that if green were here, he'd direct people last back to our last podcast in his last chapter that there is such a thing as overexposure. The more you're exposed, the more vulnerable you are to cancel culture, right? 
Yeah, so so true. This is very thought provoking, and it, it brings me to something that's a term that's become popular over the years, and that is this whole imposter syndrome thing. And so I've heard it often talked about, you know, within the educational and self growth, and oh, you're you're experiencing imposter syndrome and this and that. But again, that term is based on comparatives to other people. And here we are digging into the fact that we don't really know people, right? We have all these reputations that are based on social media, right? They're strictly determined by what they show on their videos or what they say on their social posts. People that we have, and this can go to politics or anything else, people that we have not necessarily a real in-depth relationship with. So we don't really know them. So we talk about being an imposter, but we don't know that person and who we're comparing ourselves to, right, is usually unknown to us. So it just it, it provokes a lot of thought of me to go, you know, where do we come up with these terms? And I like what Green said here. He said, make your reputation simple and base it on one sterling quality. Yes. This single quality, efficiency, say, or seductiveness becomes a kind of calling card that announces your presence and places others under a spell. A reputation for honesty will allow you to practice all manner of deception. Ouch. <laughs> that hasn't have anything to do with politics. <laughs> Casanova used his reputation as a great seducer to pave the way for his future conquests. Women who had heard of his powers became immensely curious and wanted to discover for themselves what had made him so romantically successful. So I think that's you know what we see a lot of with modern day influencers maybe leaning in to one particular area uh, of strength, which becomes their reputational quality. But is that who they really are as a person? Does that interpret and, you know, in essence, reveal their entire character? Probably not. Well, Caleb, to quote my Japanese wife, um, who is like my toughest, hardest sales manager. Be careful you don't misquote her now. Oh, I'm going to quote her exactly. <laughs> and even with the right accent. Result is everything. I love it. <laughs> so uh, basically everything Green's talking about there is branding. Hello. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and actually my favorite story of that, uh, we're, uh, we're kind of, this is turning into the Manuel uh, Miranda podcast, <laughs> but here, here's another Hamilton reference, N not Hamilton per se, but when Miranda, I'm sure we've all heard this story, but he talks about how when he was back at art school, he was surrounded by all these amazing, rich, talented, privileged kids and everything. And he was like, geez, I better pick a lane and be good at it. <laughs> right. So, I mean, uh, he's, he's kind of a great example of a modern success story in doing that. And uh, the other example that Green gives is um, Kissinger had such a great reputation in international diplomacy that was his shuttle diplomacy he was going back and forth between all these countries and very, very, very long story, incredibly short. Nobody wanted to look like they were too unreasonable to talk to the reasonable Kissinger because he had mm. the reputation of being reasonable. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> oh, sorry. Get myself back in there properly. Um, I just wanted to counter, uh, since we were on the subject of your reputation and how to be honest. And, and once you can learn to do that, then, then, you know, you're, you're most effective at telling lies. You told a story about your wife. I'm going to tell a quote from my dad who was not a great philosopher, but, but had, had a couple of very choice pearls of wisdom that he imparted to me. Uh, one of them was the most important thing in life is sincerity. Once you learn to fake that you've got it made. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of truth in that. There is, isn't it? And we really are talking about reputational branding here, aren't we, Chris? So, but you know what? I think this does get us now to the the um, the the last the one of the last things, or maybe the last thing we want to get to. And, and we touched on this in the last podcast on on saying less in the different levels, mm -hmm. like whether you're the king or the jester or the courtesan. But I think that um, let's tie it all together now. And if you have, if you're only watching this podcast and you haven't watched chapter four yet, why are you still here? Go, go back and watch four first and then watch this one. Uh, but on those levels, I'm reminded of, we're telling funny little quips now. I don't remember who I first heard this from. I'm sure I've heard it a million times and everyone's heard this before, but never pick a fight with an idiot. They'll drag you down to their level and whip your ass with experience, right? <laughs> and so when it I'll comes to that. our reputation and saying less, I think it, we are behooved to remember that sometimes. Agreed. If we're in a position of power, 
um, a lot of times it's easier to just sit back. And I'm glad we finally got back around to this because I've been thinking about this for the last two recordings. But were you watching any Wimbledon this weekend? Uh, unfortunately, I have not. I've been preoccupied with uh, other responsibilities, which I will not delve into at this moment. But you have watched tennis. And so you know, as I, I love and, and you play tennis and you're an ex- And yep. so um, I, I know you'll agree with this, Caleb, and maybe you can even expand on it a little bit. But when you're watching a tennis match, you can tell at least on a point by point basis, who's in charge Mm -hmm. by who's not moving as much. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Agreed. Especially, and even especially on a serve and volley, I guess maybe the exception would be on a serve and volley when there's a real quick attack and pen in a quick decisive point, but on a, on a rally situation, the guy or girl who's not moving and pushing the other person all around the court is the one who's in charge, generally speaking. That's right. And, and I, th- I think that's also true with chess and soccer. Mm-hmm. And we could go on and on and on. But um, like, uh, who, who are some of your favorite tennis players? Have you have you noticed that? That's kind of what oh, a- absolutely. Tennis. There, there's so much psychology in tennis, and it, it is as much as it is a you know one of the most physical games and sports I've ever played. It's as equally as much a mental and psychological sport, and you really can read people and find out you know how we psych ourselves out or how we allow our adversary to psych us out. Without a doubt. Well, Michael so. was just talking about his dad. And once my dad started to get a little bit older and I started to get a little bit better at tennis, uh, I knew that my dad still had a pretty good stroke, but he didn't want to have to run. So I started using drop shots all the time. And he, <laughs> he <hates laughs> that's just that. mean, man. So I'd have to come up for, and then, and then, and then I had learned how to do an offensive lob, you know? So, but yeah. yeah you, so. you took advantage of your daddy. I mean, your opponent. <laughs> <laughs> my enemy. <laughs> so, as it kind of, we bring this to a close, guys, let's dig into this reversal. Green says there is no possible reversal when it comes to reputation. Reputation is critical. There are no exceptions to this law. Perhaps not caring what others think of you, you gain a reputation for insolence and arrogance, but that can be a valuable image in itself. Oscar Wilde used it to great advantage since we must live in society and must depend on the opinions of others. And this goes back to what you and Michael were both referencing and all of us really in in social media and this uh, contrast different, you know, just how differently things might be said or stated with the, you know, cancel culture movement. There's nothing to be gained by neglecting your reputation by not caring how you are perceived. You let others decide this for you. I guess if you're okay with that, mm-hmm. be the master of your fate and also of your reputation. I agree that there's no possible reversal. And there's one last thing that we haven't quite touched on yet. There being no possible reversal it's in everybody's interest at all times, unless you're like the actual king or queen of the universe uh, to be making whatever reasonable, uh, and in my opinion, whatever ethical, reasonable efforts you can make to improve your reputation. Um, But I I think that the, one of the things that green talks about is one of the ways you can do that is through association. Mm -hmm. That's right. And and maybe this podcast is somewhat of an example of that. Um, I think uh, in the case of the three of us, we all have different circles of uh, influence and we all strengthen each other a little bit by association, just with this little project being one little example. Um, uh, Michael, uh, if you don't mind popping on uh, and talking about your core business, um, you're, uh, you're very much associated with a previous very successful uh, event. Uh, uh, this would be an appropriate time to talk about that for a second. I think it's a perfect example of association and reputation. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure exactly what you're getting at, but yeah, I mean, I'm currently involved in starting a new uh, public event if, for people into sci-fi and fantasy and comics and that kind of stuff. And it's a smaller event, but I'm definitely utilizing the fact of a reputation of me having created a much larger event, uh, Denver Comic Con, having been part of the group that put that together in the first place, you know, a decade ago. And, and so the success on that and my part that I played in that is definitely part of what I'm utilizing in terms of reputation mm-hmm. to start a much smaller event, Galacticon, now that I'm starting here in Denver. So, you know, for people who are into that kind of thing. So, And Michael, if I'm not mistaken, isn't the date of that Galacticon taking over for a time slot of the year when there? Had That's, been- it's not a time slot, but there, there was a previous event that ran for, for several decades. And so that event had a very good positive reputation associated right. with it, Starfest and the people mm-hmm. that ran that. I was part of that event at one point. So, yes. So, so uh, for me, I'm, it's kind of a, a twofer. It's a double. It's it's utilizing the fact that I'm familiar with the previous event, Starfest, and and its reputation is good with the audience here.
here in Denver. So I'm utilizing that to say that the new event as a similar size to that event and a similar kind of feel to it is, is, is very much trying to be in the spirit of that event while well, trying to create a new event, but in the spirit. So that's, that's where I'm trying to kind of capture and utilize the reputation of the previous event. And then my own personal reputation is having helped build a much larger event as well. So yeah, reputation very much plays into my selling of this event and the putting together of this event on a daily basis right now. And you're building up the event through the association with your reputation and the reputation of the other event. Correct. Much like the robber barons did when they started buying art or much like P.T. Barnum did when he started bringing in the legit celebrity lady mm -hmm. and starting to, because I don't think we can leave this chapter. It would be a disservice to this chapter without talking about Barnum for a quick second. So uh, Barnum goes from being a guy who has no reputation um, and who needs to build his reputation, who actually loses a major contract because he doesn't have reputation and he needs to basically ruin the other people's reputation. Mm -hmm. Now that might sound really, really cold, but, but if we're real in almost any business anywhere, there's probably other public events going on at the same time as Michael's event. Right. That's all we're really talking about. Yep. Uh, I mean, Caleb, you and I are involved in all kinds of different businesses, we're both mm -hmm. of us, but but one of them is insurance. Mm -hmm. and, and I happen to think that there are some very, very bad insurance products out there that are, come as close as I would think of to anything in the world to my enemies. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, when I see a mosquito in my house, I don't hesitate to kill that. Right. Same with spiders. So I have no, that's to me, that's ethical. And yeah. I have no compunction about... If it's, if it's in the interest of giving people good and valid information as a professional, and this isn't a commercial for my business, I'm not even going to say what I'm talking about, but I routinely educate people when it's going to be in their interest to learn what I'm talking about. And when I do that, I'm effectively destroying the reputation of something else. Right. That is true. So an example. And, and I'm also using my association yeah. with like other big companies and I'm not even going to mention who they mm -hmm. are or whatever, mm -hmm. but. In our business, we associate ourselves with companies, almost all of us in almost any business, we build our reputation by associating with such and such company. Mm -hmm. One that would like be older than your great grandfather, probably. Yeah. Uh, no, there's anyway. one I work with that's 175. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, that's what I was getting at. A final caveat that really comes to mind um, in talking about all of this. And, and again, we've, we've, we've shared a lot. We've, we've bounced off of a lot of examples, but I think it's something that's very different, obviously from the people that lived in the time that green wrote about and even making this comparison to maybe a quarter century ago or a half century ago is the ability for us to essentially reinvent ourselves. So we live in such a crazy social media age, right? You, there was no social media. There was no television or radio back then, right? You had your group of people. You had your nation of Rome. If your reputation was shot, you know, unless you're going to, I guess, move to another country, there was no way of that being restored. Right. Whereas now with social media, right, essentially that could be wiped out, but we always have the opportunity to reach a whole other audience that's out there in the world because of that reach. So just wanted to throw that out there. Because I think there, there, there is there is hope there maybe for people who've destroyed their reputations that they can reach a new audience and have as much influence as uh, they possibly could. And I think it is a warning about being overexposed. I, I think that if Green were here, he'd, he'd say, if I knew this 25 years ago, I would have said it even stronger. Both of the last two chapters we've talked about. Guard your reputation with your life. And know when to shut up. Again, if you haven't watched uh, the Chapter 4 podcast, go back and check that out. So uh, my last thing, I just want to uh, talk uh, for just one second on the way out before you close it, Caleb. Just fundamentally with all this stuff about manipulation and everything, bottom line is I think it's more important than ever to be a good person. To not just act like a good person, but to just be a good person. And if you are a good person and you don't run your mouth unnecessarily and you don't overexpose yourself, I think that's the best defense against counterculture. Boom. Actions always speak louder than our words. Guys, we appreciate you taking the time to tune in. We hope this has been beneficial for you. Make sure you do go like and subscribe to the Living Like a Bank podcast. Share the episodes with a friend, with a loved one, someone that 
you know that's wanting to empower their legacy because it begins with the right information, the right knowledge, the right education that you can take to build that foundation and protect your family legacy moving forward. So we look forward to talking to you next time. Take care for now. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please be sure you subscribe on YouTube or the podcast on anchor.fm and follow me on social media at Metalpreneur. If you're ready to talk about building your own bank, use the QR code or go to rebrand.ly slash build a bank. Be sure and join us for the next broadcast as together we learn to live and operate just like the banks do.